Good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for coming. My name is Drew Dameron, and I'm the library manager here at the Tokyo American Club. We have the pleasure of hosting three fascinating individuals for tonight's Tech Talk entitled A New Space Age. Mr. Garvey McIntosh, the NASA Asia representative based at the US Embassy in Tokyo. He has been responsible for the coordination of NASA programs and interests in the Asia Pacific region since 2017. Mr. Shinichi Nakasuka, a professor at Tokyo University's Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics School of Engineering since 2004. He is a member of the Japan Society for Aeronautical and Space Sciences, and his research fields include space systems design and operation, machine learning, and astrodynamics. And Mr. Chris Blackerby, the group COO of Astroscale since 2017. His organization is a private orbital debris removal company headquartered in Tokyo, Japan. Mr. Blackerby is also a member of our club, and prior to Astroscale, he held Garvey's position as a NASA Asia representative here in Tokyo from 2012 to 2017. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for coming tonight and sharing your expertise with us. We will start with a short introduction from each of the speakers, followed by a moderated panel discussion. Following the panel, we'll open it up for questions from those attending in person and virtually. For those online, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions to me and I'll ask them on your behalf. And for those in the room, please kindly use the microphone that we'll pass to you to ensure that our virtual guests and later viewers on YouTube understand what was asked. Thank you again for coming tonight and please join me in welcoming our guests. So thanks Drew and thanks for that nice introduction. And um, so my name is Garvey McIntosh and like I said, I've been the NASA representative here uh, at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo for past four years. Uh, my wife, Melanie, is there, so thanks for coming. She never comes anything in my, my in mind, but she said, Chris told me that she came, he came because she's on, so I guess that's, that's it. But uh, yeah, and I've been at NASA for 18 years. Actually, Chris and I started in the Office of International Relations all about the same time in 2003. I started in 2003, so I've been at NASA for a total of 18 years. Should I? Oh, I, I do it, right? Okay, so my, my goal is kind of set the stage about what NASA's programs are going forward, what we've done and what, what our programs are kind of going forward. Um, so this is kind of the organizational structure of NASA. Um, I think if you understand this, you kind of understand the kind of how NASA is organized and, and, and the way we do things. Um, so the DNA of NASA is, is aviation. Before NASA was NASA, uh, we did aviation research to keep the US kind of competitive in the field of aviation. So that's kind of where we started. So we do aeronautics, that's the smallest kind of area of focus at NASA um, in terms of finances. Uh, the largest is human exploration. That's everything that NASA does to keep humans safe and, and kind of exploring the solar system. Everything you might see on TV, uh, International Space Station, uh, commercial crew, all that is under the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Science, uh, robotic missions, um, um, everything we do in terms of robotics. We have kind of four main areas of robotics at NASA. Uh, we do um, Earth science, that's looking at the Earth the most precious kind of planet we have in our solar system that it can, can have human life. Uh, we do uh, heliophysics, that's looking at the sun. Uh, we do planetary science, that's everything in our, own plan in our own planetary solar system. And then we do astrophysics, that's everything uh, beyond our solar system. So we have four areas of science that we do at NASA. So those are kind of the four areas that we do with science. And then uh, space technology, that's looking at all the technologies that NASA uh, needs in the future to make sure that our missions are successful uh, going forward. Um, NASA is kind of a broad uh, agency in terms of how we are spread across the United States. Um, you know, we're in California, we're in uh, Maryland. Uh, I spent uh, uh, 14 years at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. That's originally from. Um, and so today I'll kind of focus on uh, human spaceflight, putting humans in space. And so that's like the Johnson Space Center in Houston. That's the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Uh, that's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. So those are the kind of the main uh, space flight centers that I'll kind of focus on today in terms of putting humans in space. Um, I, th I don't think you talk about space without talking about the history of how we got to where we are. Uh, probably many of you know the history of, uh, of, of what I'll talk about today. Uh, the first satellite actually to launch into space was not um, the United States. It was the former Soviet Union, uh, uh, Russia, as you might, or, or, or the former Soviet Union. Um, as you might know, at that time, there was kind of a Cold War going on and there was a space race. And so the first actual satellite was not a NASA satellite. It was uh, a former Soviet Union uh, Russian satellite in 1957, and it was called Sputnik. Um, um, so in reaction to that, you know, because we're in the space race, something 
really amazing happened one year later. And what happened? Does anybody know what happened in 1958, one year after Sputnik? NASA was founded 1958. So in reaction to Sputnik, that's how, you know, if it wasn't for Sputnik, I, I might not have a job because uh, NASA was founded one year later after Sputnik in a direct reaction um, because there was concerns that the Russians in the Cold War were beating the United States in space. And so we established a space agency to make sure that we could carry our mission successfully. So 1958, NASA was founded. Um, and so, um, you know, I like to think NASA is a pretty young organization. Um, we're only like 63 years old. I'm 52, so I'm almost as old as NASA. And so, yeah, I think that we've done a lot, you know, in 63 years, you know, I've talked about what we've done, but, you know, we've been to the moon, we built an international space station, we spent um, 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 robotic missions to almost every uh, planetary body within our solar system, including ast many asteroids and comets, and we've done a lot in 63 years. So people think NASA is kind of an old organization, but I think we're a young organization and we're still a learning organization. I think we still have a lot to do. Um, and so, yeah, we were founded in 1958. But something else happened in 1961. I'll give you a hint. NASA kind of lost again. Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say you know everything. <laughs> but what happened in 1961? Yes, very good. Yurik Gagarin uh, launched into space. The first man in space happened in 1961. Believe it or not, the US, huh? Of Earth year. <laughs> so uh, it, it, two great things happened. Nikoski Sensei was born and uh, Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space. So that that was kind of a big hit to NASA. Can you imagine we lost Sputnik? We lost the first satellite in space and then we were beat in humans. This was a huge shockwave to NASA in 1961. We were just like, what? You know, we lost again. And so what happened? Everybody knows. John F. Kennedy one year later said we're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade. And by God, we did it. 1969, we landed first three men on the moon in 1969. Um, Neil Armstrong was the first, as we know. Buzz Aldrin was the second, and Michael Collins kind of stayed in the in, in the ego to make sure that everybody was safe. Um, and so, um, yeah, we went to the moon in 1969. But you can see the, pair, the way that happened. You know, first satellite, you know, NASA, Yuri Gagarin, and boom, you know, we have to do something big. They put a man in space, we got to do something big. And so, yeah, 1969, we tried to get a man on the moon and we did it. It's pretty amazing. But I think most people don't know that, you know, that wasn't kind of the end of the Apollo program. We talked about this later. How many times did NASA go to the moon between 1969 and 1972? Six times. So we had seven missions and six of them landed safely. Seven missions um, in terms of launches. Everybody knows the famous movie Apollo 13. They went up there. They had problems. So we kept the, the biggest thing when you tell them, please keep the astronauts safe. They got home safely. Thank goodness. Uh, but they didn't land. So six successful missions between 1969 and 1972 landed on the moon successfully. Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. That's pretty amazing. So in a short period of time that we landed on the moon successfully three times. And those, you know, you know, we haven't actually start, stopped researching the moon since we ended the program in 1972. And so we've had many robotic missions that have told us, you know, all of the stuff that's actually still left on the moon from the Apollo missions. And we can really get an understanding of where those places take place. But in 1972, um, the world was kind of changing. Um, we kind of went to the moon six times successfully. Um, it was very expensive program, the Apollo missions, you know, taking people in. We weren't really getting a lot of science. The biggest science we were getting is kind of bringing back rocks, you know, as the astronauts went up there back to Earth. So that was kind of the extent of our science that we we're getting. So we decided that, you know, since the world was changing, we do something new. And everybody knows after that, we started the space station program for one by like one vote under the Reagan administration. And so we started the space station program soon afterwards. And everybody knows that to, to build the International Space Station, we had to have a vehicle, and so we built the, the famous space shuttle. As you can see, that's the space shuttle right there. That's all the materials that were brought to the space shuttle in the call of the cargo bay. All of them, everything that was taken up to the International Space Station was brought up by the space shuttle. Um, and uh, yeah, it was really, really uh, exciting time, you know, different path for NASA, but I think it was, it was, it was one that was really well thought out and I think it was the correct path. I think, you know, we the Apollo program wasn't sustainable, but doing something in, in closer to Earth in lower Earth orbit was a good choice. Um, and so actually April 1981 was exactly 
20 years after Yuri Gagarin, which is pretty amazing. So Yuri Gagarin was April 1961, and 20 years later was uh, the first uh, space shuttle in 1981. Um, and so the next video kind of shows uh, all the parts that were taken up by the International Space Station um, over the years um, through, the, through this video. Can you play that? It has some really kind of funky music to it, but it's fine. Usually when I when I I usually dance when I dance. That's over a number of years. And I think right there is the Japanese uh, contributions around 2009 or so. And that's the International Space Station complete um, in 2011. Um, and so in 2011, once the International Space Station was complete, we retired the space, um, the spa all of the space shuttles. Um, and, you know, I think the space shuttle was uh, just an amazing vehicle. Unfortunately, we had two accidents, but, you know, space is, is hard. It's, 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 it's not easy. Um, and so obviously Challenger in 1986, Columbia in 2003, uh, but it did what it's supposed to do. It, it, it completed. Uh, the most magnificent feat um, or that man has ever known, and that's building the International Space Station. You can look at the International Space Station every night. It's usually the brightest star in the sky, and it goes around the Earth every 90 minutes, so it's pretty amazing. Um, and then uh, that's my kind of favorite view of the International Space Station. You can see all of the different parts. You can see all the par partner contributions. You can see the Russian segment, the U.S. segment. Uh, you can see the Canada arm. You can see the Japanese um, um, Kibo module right there. You know, it's the largest research module. And you can see the European contribution, the Columbus module. So that was taken by the space uh, astronauts on the space shuttle as they were leaving the space station. And they took that show. And it's kind of kind of gives a really nice overview of the International Space Station. Um, we can't talk about the great contributions by Japanese astronauts. Every Japanese astronaut, uh, all 11, have flown to the International Space Station. Uh, the ones in the orange and the blue, at that time they flew on the space shuttle, and all the or astronauts in white um, obviously flew on the Russian Soyuz. Um, one interesting thing is if you find the Russian Soyuz, you have to know fluent Russian as well, because if there's a problem, you don't need it, you can't do that. I need an interpreter, you know, you got to know every, you know, so all the astronauts um, who flew on, on, on Soyuz speak fluent Russian, and everybody flies on the space. Well, every almost every astronaut is fluent in English, it was probably as well. But um, yeah, so yeah, it's pretty until all the all the guys and the white astronauts are fluent in English, fluent in Russian, and obviously fluent in Japanese because they're Japanese astronauts. Um, that's just kind of my highlight picture I kind of put in my presentations because that's me with seven of the eleven Japanese astronauts at the U.S. Embassy for the um, the anniversary of Apollo 11, uh, 50th anniversary in 2019. Uh, that's from right to left, Furukawa, um, then um, um, Chiaki Mukai, who's the first female astronaut in space, uh, Onishi-san, who's actually taller than me. That's me. I'm not an astronaut, but I want to be. Um, Naoko Yamazaki, uh, the, the second woman to fly in the space and the last woman to fly on the space sh shuttle in 2010. Uh, the, probably the most famous one is Mori-san, who was the first Japanese astronaut who flew in the space, space, uh, space, went to the space station. Uh, Koichi Wakata, who's flew four times and is probably the, is the next astronaut to fly, who's going to fly fifth times, and Kanai-san, who's a Japanese astronaut, I mean, Japanese, a medical doctor, sorry. Um, and, and I think what we're going to talk about today is kind of all of the commercial kind of exciting activities that are happening on the International Space Station. As we talked about earlier, um, you know, there's commercial crew now, um, and there's commercial cargo going to the International Space Station. Uh, soon we have Sierra Nevada that would take their dream chaser up. Uh, North of Grumman's taking a uh, commercial cargo up. Uh, Boeing will soon be taking astronauts on the Starliner. Uh, Gitai is a Japanese company that is doing uh, robotic missions up on the International Space Station. Robotics that does kind of uh, uh, the same things that humans do in space. And so there's really a lot of commercial activities going on in space. So I think it makes a little bit exciting time. Um, and then, you know, talking about all of the different players in space. Astroscale is here. So you're up on my slide, Chris. Um, Gitai, yeah, I, I'm looking out for you, Chris, you know, 
And then, uh, you know, there's a lot of different Japanese companies. I could talk about all of those, but those are all Japanese companies that are getting involved in commercial space from iSpace, actual scale, Axel space. It's really an exciting time. Um, the first crew mission had uh, Noguchi-san, who's up on that um, flyer right there. Um, and so um, the first commercial crew by SpaceX had four U.S. astronauts and one Japanese astronaut, which is really exciting. And obviously, you know that uh, a few weeks ago, Hoshide-san, who was up on the International Space Station, flew with a French astronaut, Thomas Pesquet, Japanese astronaut, two NASA astronauts, and he landed land. So both of the first two SpaceX crew missions had Japanese astronauts. And then, so um, you have stickers there, um, you know, NASA's, um, we can talk about this in the Q&A, has embarked on a new program, that's the Artemis program. And that is just right there. It, it's NASA will land the first woman and the first person of color. I think it was mentioned in the Apollo area, I think NASA or in the United States really wants to have a diverse group of astronauts up in the future. All 12 astronauts that landed on the moon, were unfortunately white males, which is a good thing at the time, but it wasn't very diverse. So, you know, our, our theme now is we want to have the first woman and the first person of color. That's what the Biden administration has said for the Artemis program. That means they want to have a very diverse uh, astronaut corps with women and people from all different genders, kind of looking like the United States. Um, and we want to go back to the moon um, and, and, and build an infrastructure there, different than Apollo, stay for long periods of time and use that and what we learn as kind of a precursor to eventually getting humans to Mars. So that's the Artemis program, and that's the program that NASA is kind of embarking on and moving forward with high speed right now. And we want to try to involve as many commercial players like Chris. Uh, we want to use um, use of uh, small satellites. I think the Cossack Sensei will talk about today in terms of, you know, right now there's a lot of universities and everything that you don't need these big telescopes. You can use smaller telescopes to get a lot of good science. So we want to have a very robust um, kind of presence on the lunar surface and that's that's what we that's what we want to get out of the Artemis program. Um, that's kind of a snapshot on the Artemis program. We want to build a new vehicle called SLS with an Orion capsule. We're going to have humans there. We want to try to involve many commercial players. We want to have the first woman and the first person of color. Um, we're going to build a gateway that's going to go around the lunar surface. It's going to give us sustainability, kind of like the International Space Station around the Earth. We're calling that the gateway. And then we're going to build um, a base camp. We want to try to have long-term sustained presence on the, on the lunar surface. That's kind of where we are with the Artemis program. And my last video, um, hopefully has sound, um, kind of puts everything I talked about together. The history, I try to give you some history of how we got to every day, where NASA is going for the future, and all the commercial and international partners we want to try to include um, going forward in terms of the Artemis program and, 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 and really having a bright future for you know, the young people here in terms of um, extending human presence throughout the solar system. So that's my last video. Ignition sequence start. All engines are running. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this dictator is out. We have achieved the earth shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking. One left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of giants to go farther than humanity has ever been. 
we will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this call. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for your kind invitation to this uh, very very interesting meeting. My name is Shinji Nakasuka, uh, the professor of the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, University of Tokyo. I I remember that I saw the you know Apollo landing on the moon. Uh, my uh, at the time I was about eight years old, and I saw the TV. Uh, which showed the you know uh, Apollo landing on the moon. Uh, the name of the lander is uh, Eagle, right? Yeah. Eagle, Eagle landing on the moon with my father. It was a very very impressive moment, and that's why I'm staying here. I'm <laughs> I started my job on the uh, space technology uh, because of that Apollo impression. So it gave me it to change my life. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I'm working on the, uh, you know, this kind of the micro nano pico satellite. So it is a satellite less than 100 kilograms. As Gabi said that recently the space system is gets smaller, less expensive and, the, you know, quicker. So that's a very important game change which are currently occurring in the space field. And so we started a satellite development around the 2000. Okay, and the, our first satellite, CubeSat, one kilogram CubeSat, which was launched in 2003, was the world's first one kilogram satellite. And the, I, I made that satellite with Akihabara, uh, you know, component, Akihabara parts. <laughs> so it costs very low, just like uh, maybe 20,000 US dollars. It's very cheap. It's about a 100, 100th or more than that, more one thousandth of the uh, usual satellite. So it's very cheap. And we started the satellite development, and we are, we have been using that satellite initially for the education of the student. But gradually, we are using that satellite for the various applications, not only the education, but also the Earth observation, or you know, space science, or you know, communication, or uh, and and many other business. So that's what we have been doing. So currently, uh, we already developed and launched 13 satellites, and many many students have been trained. Uh, within this you know satellite project so this is what we have been doing and uh, our technology developed within the university research has been transferred to the venture company so we are now collaborating with many venture companies including the uh, axel space which are doing the uh, you know optical satellite uh, conservation business and also the SAR satellite conservation business inspective and the uh, ground storage uh, ground storage ground station operation business in Fostera and many other companies. So uh, in this way, the you know, university collaboration with the venture companies is very, very important. You know, venture companies are you know, using the university technology to do business and the money came to the, you know, come, come to that company and that money comes back to the university. Then we can do the next stage, you know, research and development. That kind of the ecosystem is very much important. So we are using such kind of the you know collaboration with the venture companies. So let me show you the several satellite uh, we developed. So this is a satellite called the Hodoyoshi three and four, uh, which were develop, uh, developed and launched in 2014. It is a very low uh, cost, about uh, three million US dollars, which and the development time was within two years. And it has a very good capability of the communication and the attitude control, which are suitable for the uh, Earth observation as well as space sciences. And so this is one example of the picture taken by this satellite. So it is a six meter ground resolution picture. So this kind of the uh, very good picture can uh, can uh, captured by uh, this kind of the small satellite. So the important thing is that we will launch many of these kind of the small satellites to observe the Earth frequently. So this frequency is very, very important. It is called the time resolution. We have very good time resolution with many satellites. That is a concept of the consideration. So now this kind of the small satellite in the consideration manner uh, can observe the Earth very frequently, which can give us a very good information of the change of the Earth's surface. 
And the, uh, we are now uh, developing the, you know, 6U cubes. 6U means uh, 10 centimeter, 20 centimeter, 30 centimeter, very small satellite with 11 kilogram uh, called the uh, Equius, which will go to the moon. Uh, using the NASA's SLR. Thank you very much, Gabi. So <laughs> you provide us a very good one. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so now this satellite is already finished and the transported to the United States and now waiting for the launch of the SLS, new rocket. Uh, maybe, I hope it will be next year. February. February, okay, good. Thank you very much. <laughs> and anyway, so thank you very much for uh, the United States. And the, uh, also that we are uh, developing uh, this kind of very small satellite, which are very versatile to be used for the Earth observation space science and also the educational support to the foreign countries. So this is called the 6U CubeSat. And the, also I'd like to uh, you know, thank you to the United States for giving us an uh, opportunity of just uh, experimenting the United States desert. It is uh, you know, uh, called ARIS Experimental Event where uh, we launch our CANSAT. It is a very small CANSAT satellite up to the four kilometer altitude using amateur rocket provided by the uh, United States Am Amateur Rocket Group. So maybe you can see that this kind of the e event have been happening every year. And the, uh, many, many Japanese students, like uh, more than 100 students, bring their CANSAT to the United States and uh, test it. That is a very good basis for the education of the satellite development within Japan. So we are very grateful uh, to the United States uh, for providing us this, uh, this kind of the experimental opportunity. And the, uh, because of this kind of the activities, Japanese universities are very active in the develop, development of the, their own very small satellite. And up to now, about uh, you know, 53 satellite, university satellite were launched within, uh, until uh, last year. So, uh, so maybe you can see that many type of the satellites, starting from a one kilogram to about a 50 kilogram satellite, were developed and launched by the university students. And the, uh, now uh, we are, you know, uh, making an international university community called the UNICEF Global. Okay, so we are, you know, asking the many universe, uh, many countries to create a certain kind of the university community. And the, then uh, each country will get together every year uh, at the a certain place called the UNICEF Global Meeting and where uh, we exchange our experiences and the technology and so on. And the, I hope that uh, this kind of the university community can develop a certain kind of the, you know, satellite uh, in the future in order to, co uh, in order to contribute to the something like a society, international society. And also, I've been doing several this kind of the, uh, educational support to foreign country. CANSAT, which have been uh, used for the training of the university student in Japan, uh, 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 and the, using that technology, we are educating the foreign teachable persons, uh, which is called the uh, uh, CANSAT Leader Training Program, CLTP. And also, we have been teaching the foreign country to develop a 50 kilogram cross satellite. And this picture shows the Ibetonam uh, micro dragon, which was developed uh, and launched in 2019. And also uh, we are developing the uh, Rwanda satellite called the Ruasat-1, which was also uh, launched from ISS last year. And the, also the lower left uh, picture showed the ISS Roboto uh, programming contest. So we started that, uh, this programming contest two years ago, and many uh, Asian Pacific universities participated in this, you know, uh, robot programming contest and so on. And so this is my university job. And in addition to that, I'm working together with, uh, you know, uh, space, uh, sorry, uh, Japanese government for the uh, creation of the space policy in Japan. And they may be, so this is, uh, you know, uh, organization chaired uh, to create such kind of the, you know, policy or fundamental plan of the uh, Japanese space development and utilization. And the, sorry, I'm, sorry, can I? <laughs> I'm in the committee uh, of the uh, space policy. Okay, maybe as you see, and the, I contributed to the, you know, development of the third and the fourth fundamental plan of the Japanese space policy. So, uh, so this is my another job, okay? Anyway, but the, I like the former one. <laughs> <laughs> but I should do this. 
Okay, so uh, anyway, so I'm doing this kind of the you know, satellite development together with my students. So if you are interested in this kind of the small satellite, please let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Chris. And uh, first, it's great to be on the stage with these two uh, long term friends, Garvey and Nakaska Sensei. I've known for a long time. As Garvey said, we started at the same time. Uh, he came to Japan four years ago and he took my job and he <laughs> and he took my house. <laughs> but he let me keep my family, which is <laughs> I was very grateful, so thank you, thank you. And uh, Nakaska Sensei, you guys, um, you know who James Brown is? James Brown, James Brown was a singer, and his nickname was the hardest working man in show business. Nakaska Sensei is the hardest working man in space. As you heard, all of the things he's doing, all of the incredible amount of satellites they're building, and he's part of this space policy committee, which he only touched on on the last slide, but that is really directing space policy for Japan. Uh, and he showed a satellite there, Horyoshi, and he didn't mention this, but one of the satellites that we're building is based on the design that he did for that satellite. So I owe lots of thanks to the people on the stage. Um, so uh, I work now for a company called Astroscale, and I'm not the only Astroscale person in the room. I also want to just recognize Christine Boyland, who is an executive assistant at Astroscale, and Jean Fuji, who is our chief engineer. So we've got a, uh, a good Astroscale uh, contingent here. And what we're trying to do at Astroscale is transform the space economy. And we're trying to do that through on-orbit servicing. So that means going to satellites and fixing them or moving them out of the way. So just like if a car dies on the highway here on Earth, you don't leave it on the highway. You go and move it or you refuel it or you repair it. We don't do that in space right now. And it's creating a real problem. It's creating lots of debris. This is not a real picture, by the way. <laughs> But it is a good image that shows that the problem exists. Because what's happening is there's a rapidly intensifying environmental and economic crisis in orbit. Existing space debris, there's a lot of it. And as you just heard from Nikoska Sensei, there's a lot more launches coming up. It's not just the Soviet Union and the United States that are launching satellites like they did back at the start of NASA. We've got smaller countries, we've got universities, we've got lots of private companies that are all launching satellites right now, and it's adding to the risk that's in space. And so we at Astroscale want to have a safe and sustainable orbital environment for future generations. We're a, we're a company, we're a private company. We're not a, we're not a nonprofit. We're here to, to, to make money. But we also think that there is a benefit to society with what we're trying to do. So the fact is, the global economy is dependent on satellite data. So much of what we do every day, from talking to relatives, getting directions, removing money, uh, checking the weather, understanding climate change, it's dependent on data that we get from space. And as you see on the, the slide, it's a bit tough to see, but you see the, the, those climbing numbers that's the number of objects and the number of pieces of debris that are in orbit right now. It's going to keep going up. And you see a couple of, of big jumps. It's kind of hard to see, but you see some big jumps right here and right there. That first big jump, it was an anti-satellite test. And you probably saw it just recently, the, the Russians did one. This was from the Chinese. Thousands of pieces of additional debris in orbit. This other one was an actual accident. So an active communication satellite from a company called Iridium ran into a defunct Russian satellite and they crashed and they created a bunch more debris. So these kind of things have happened 
whether it's an intentional destruction of a satellite or accidental, it's happened. And it's going to happen more. And the more crowded it gets, the more difficult it is for the satellites on which we rely to provide us with that data that we're dependent. And so you see what's happened here, right here at the end, that big jump, that's been all of these satellites that have launched recently, SpaceX, Starlink, you may have heard about the constellation of satellites they've launched. That's that big jump. It's only gonna keep going up. So what we're looking to do at Astroscale is to focus on removing some of that debris, fixing some of the satellites that are up there. And we're looking at two orbits primarily. It's where we get most of our stuff. There's more, but there's two main ones. And one is called low Earth orbit. It's about 200 kilometers to about 2,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And that's where the space station is. Space station's at about 400 kilometers. A lot of the satellites we get for Earth observation, all of those SpaceX satellites, they're all at about this low Earth orbit area. And then the other one is called geostationary orbit, and that's about 36,000 kilometers out. And that's where we have a lot of communication satellites. And the satellites in that orbit are targeted to the Earth's rotation. So you put a satellite in that orbit over Tokyo, it's going to stay over Tokyo. So a lot of communications, a lot of military satellites out there. At Astroscale, we want to focus on both of those orbits. We want to go to the low Earth orbit and remove some of that debris. There's thousands of pieces, tens of thousands of pieces of debris that are bigger than a baseball in that orbit. There's millions of tiny little pieces of debris. So we want to start removing some of those pieces of debris before there are more accidents. Up on the geostationary orbit, the satellites are way bigger. Down here, there are a lot of Nikoska Sensei satellites. They're smaller ones. But up there in geo, the satellites are several tons. They're like the size of a bus. They're huge. And they last for a long time. And there's a, there's a lot of debris there. And so we want to send satellites up there to fix some of the satellites or to extend the life of satellites that are in geo. So this is Astroscale. We're a global company, and we're trying to solve this global problem. When I joined about four years ago, when Garvey kicked me out of my job, you remember that part of the conversation? When I joined then, Astroscale had about 25 people in, in the company. Now we have about 250, and we are global. We have offices in Singapore, Japan, UK, US, and Israel. Uh, we just raised our fifth, sixth, Series F. What letter, what, what letter is F in this? What is it? One, two, three, four. Sixth. Our sixth funding round. Series F of $109 million. So we've raised about $300 million total now. Uh, we've got investors in Japan and in Europe uh, who are giving us money and they're expecting a return. This wasn't a donation. They're not just telling us, take the money and see what you can do. They expect us to return. So they expect that there's going to be a business as do we. So the four main areas that we're focused on, our four main business lines, are, I'll go through them. The first is, is end-of-life services, EOL. In this one, we're talking about putting a plate on all satellites that get launched so that we can go up and bring those satellites down. So our proposal is to have that plate have a magnetic surface, ferromagnetic material on it, and then we would launch a satellite that has a magnet at the end of it that would extend out and grab on to that satellite and remove it from orbit. So that's basically for future debris. Protect against future debris. The other service we have in low Earth orbit, these are both in low Earth orbit, is active debris removal. That's going up and grabbing a piece of debris that's there right now. So we use the same kind of uh, software technology and a lot of the same uh, internal code that we would use for the end of life, but the capture has to be different. We can't use a magnet because the stuff that's up there now is not, doesn't have ferromagnetic material. So we've got to develop a robotic arm to grab onto it. And that's why we hire smart people like Gene Fuji to tell us how to make that happen. <laughs> right, Gene? Yeah. <laughs> so we're building robotic arms to grab onto the debris that's already in orbit. And both of these are in low Earth orbit. I talked about the two orbits. 
Lex is life extension. That's going up to those big satellites in geo and extending their life, working with governments and the big commercial customers to extend the life of their satellites. And the last one is in situ SSA, space situational awareness. Go up there and look what's going on. Putting cameras up there, identifying where problems might be, identifying where crowded orbits are. And all of this is focused on space sustainability. And so we're working on missions on all of these areas. We've got a mission with JAXA, the Japan Space Agency, to go do an ISSA mission, basically. Go up and look at one of their rocket bodies and see how it's turning, what debris is around it, what does it look like? And that's the first step to another mission that's going to remove that piece of debris. We don't have that one yet, but JAXA is going to put money toward it, we hope, right, Nakaska sensei Okay, good, good. <laughs> Everybody heard that, right? We heard that. So they're going to put money toward this, and then we'll bid into that mission and hopefully get that mission too. So right now, I, I mentioned a couple of people for, for AstroScale that are here. I have one more AstroScale guest. I have Elsa. This is Elsa. So this is our... What would I do without my daughter? That's my daughter, by the way, who helped me. So this is Elsa. Elsa is in orbit right now, and Elsa is testing the capabilities for debris removal. So we launched Elsa in March from Kazakhstan, and it's in an orbit right now in low Earth orbit. I've asked for others, but it's COVID, and I don't want to be trusted. But these two people I know and I live with, so I'm okay to ask them. So can you, can, this is Miyako, and this is Emika. Okay, so what's going to happen is that this servicing satellite and client satellite, they're going to separate. And so separate them out. They go pull apart, and they back up from each other. And then <laughs> using cameras and sensors that are on the servicing satellite, they cl closer together, and they attach. Click on it. Oh, no, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, Magnus, see it attaches with the magnet. <laughs> and so they're going to do that. And that's just the first thing they're going to do. The next thing they're going to do. <laughs> so they're going to go apart again, and this, this, this satellite, the client, is going to spin. <laughs> and then this is going to come forward, and it's going to circle around it, and look for this docking plate. Come on, you got it? And look for that plate. That we said we put on it and connect again. So <laughs> smart and beautiful. Um, I'll leave Elsa there. So, uh, so we've already done the first one of those tests in August of this year. We did the first test. Oh yeah, sorry. August of this year, we did the first of those tests. We moved it apart just a little bit, and we grabbed it. And now we're going to do the next test. We're going to keep doing more of these tests. We're going to go farther away. We're going to spin it. And we're going to continue to demonstrate that we can do these technical capabilities to capture the satellites in orbit. And things, other companies are buying into this. This bottom picture here is from a company called OneWeb. OneWeb has launched about 300 satellites into low Earth orbit. On most of their satellites, over 200 of them, they have a plate that we help to design the surface of that's very similar to what we have on ELSA, magnetic capture capability. So we're working with OneWeb to be able to provide service to their satellites. Now, we demonstrated this test, the first of those capture tests back in August. And this is a view from inside of our operations room from when in, in, in August. I wasn't there, I was at a conference, but Gene is right there and watching, and he'll tell you afterwards if you talk to him that he was very nervous because we were watching from this operations room and, and we had a, a team in England and a team in Japan tracking and following and preparing to capture that satellite like Miyako and Emika just showed us. And we'll show you just the reaction. I don't know if you can hear the sound, but.
That room was so relieved. I was sitting in Colorado at a conference and Nobu texted me right after and just said, we did it. And I almost cried. I was so happy. So it was a great step. It's a great step toward commercial space uh, servicing of satellites. And I'll, I'll end by saying that we're not just doing the, the engineering. We need to focus on a lot of issues related to this. We need to focus on political issues, government support, legal issues. So we have a team that's focused on policy and best practices. And we have a team that's focused on the economics of it. Because I know everybody is thinking the same question, and I'm sure I'll get asked it. Who pays for this? How do you support this as a business? And so we need to focus on how we clarify the business case for both the commercial and the government customers. And so we're, we're doing that. And so we have a team that's broad, that's international, and that is looking at technical parts, policy parts, business parts, legal aspects, uh, a growing team. And, and we like to think that we're at the vanguard of what, uh, of what the space business is going to be. So um, again, honored to be on the stage with these guys and look forward to answering any questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. That was great. So I've got a couple of questions. We're going to start our panel discussion here. I think we have time for maybe three or four, and then we'll open it up to Q&A from the audience. But my first question for everyone is that many of us are excited about NASA's Artemis program and the Lunar Gateway Space Station project. What do you find so exciting about projects like this? What should we watch for when they're going on? And what other projects deserve our attention to? Well, I, th I think that, um, you know, I think there's a, a many parts that are really excited about Artemis and Gateway. I think the most thing is if you look at historically, um, you know, NASA, we've kind of progressed to the point where we're able to, I think, successfully do something like Artemis. You know, I think during the Apollo program, we kind of proved that we can go kind of long distances, even though it was a short period of time, we can go to the moon, we can get there and bring astronauts home safely. And then after that, um, you know, we actually built an international space station and now astronauts go to the National Space Station six times, six months, uh, you know, usually about six months. The recent crew with the, including um, Akihi, I mean, Hoshide-san was there for six months and Noguchi-san was there for six months. And then so we now we know we can keep astronauts in space for long periods of time. So I think Artemis combines both of those. You know, this time we want to go back to a longer distance, go back to the moon. We want to keep astronauts and people there for long periods of time. So I think it really combines kind of the lessons learned that we have from the past. And I think that's exciting. I think another thing that I just I tried to mention in my presentation is the um, kind of how we progress in terms of, you know, during the Apollo area, it was pretty much the former Soviet Union and the United States kind of in competition. And then, you know, we looked at the ISS, you know, we had uh, a lot of uh, cooperation uh, with a lot of 15 countries, five organizations, um, United States, Europe, Canada, Russia, and Japan working together to build the International Space Station. And now we have a lot of vibrant commercial sectors. So I think the different thing that really makes exciting Artemis is a lot of the innovation that we're gonna get from the commercial sector as well. And, you know, NASA, we wanna to try to lead the program back to the moon, but we don't wanna be the kings of the moon or anything like that. We wanna build, build that pathway to get there, but we wanna build, have a platform. So a lot of um, other countries and more importantly, um, uh, companies in the commercial sector can innovate and use kind of new ideas to make that help make that sustainable approach. So I think the combination of lessons learned along with the um, combination of a growing space sector, you know, kind of what we talked about today is very, very exciting for the Artemis program, both going back to the moon and eventually having humans uh, step foot on Mars. I think it's really exciting. Okay, so uh, maybe so as you know, the Japan, Japanese people have a very special feeling about a moon. So the moon is very attractive uh, to the many Japanese people. And so many Japanese people are like, uh, you know, lunar project. And so we are very much excited about, uh, you know, this Artemis program. And for me, I think, uh, you know, Artemis program is very interesting because it's very, the way to go to the moon is very different from the Apollo era. So in the Apollo project, you know, the very big rocket should bring everything to the moon. It bring the, you know, uh, command module and the also supply module and the lander and go back to the Earth. So 
this is just a go there and come back, everything. So if we use this kind of the, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, architecture, maybe it's very difficult to go to the, you know, far away from the earth. But the, for the Artemis program, we are now trying to make a, something like infrastructure of going to the, you know, uh, far away. So first we develop the, you know, uh, the ISS and then go to the gateway, uh, which is going around the moon and the landing and the go back and the come back. So it's a, something like an infrastructure. So this is very different from the Apollo era. So how this kind of the infrastructure based in you know, a space exploration works would be very, very, you know, has a, interesting and exciting to me. Okay. Can I answer that one too? You said other programs, right? Also. Any other interesting things going yeah, on? Yeah, so um, on, on the things that uh, Garvey and Nakaska sensei talked about, uh, infrastructure and, and going to the moon, I think there's a lot of uh, commercial involvement in those. And we see that already, as Garvey talked about. But what I think that really excites me about what NASA does is the stuff that commercial doesn't want to do so much. Commercial wants to do these things like satellite servicing and, and helping to build infrastructure, but they don't necessarily want to look into deep space. There's no money in looking into deep space. So what excites me about what NASA is doing is James Webb Space Telescope. That's going to launch pretty soon. It's going to be at L2, right? L2, a million, so a million miles away beyond the moon at a, at a stable point called a Lagrange point. And it's going to look... I don't remember the number of times deeper than Hubble can already look uh, to give us a, an understanding of our universe. That's incredible. And that's why NASA is so awesome. Um, that's why we need government space agencies to do the things that commercial doesn't want to do. No commercial company is going to say, I want to go look, in, look into the Big Bang. But that's what governments do. So that's what I'm excited about from government side. Thank you. Can you tell us what the name of the telescope is one more time? Uh, James, well, well, I should let Garvey do this, but James, James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. James Webb. So, so, so James Webb, uh, right now, I think the launch date is this month. We'll see if that holds. Um, um, but um, it's kind of, it's the successor of the Hubble. So we have the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope will be the successor terms of the, the large telescope to look out, you know, as Chris said, you know, beyond our solar system to exoplanets and things beyond our own different solar systems. So, Thank you. James Webb. Yeah. Excited for that. Thanks. Kind of on this note, uh, efforts by private sectors in space are definitely a clear way for government space programs to offload costs. But with more collaboration is in, in this global economy, is domestic investment a concern? I'm curious if uh, you foresee NASA being comfortable with investing in more Japanese companies or vice versa? JAXA feels comfortable investing in more U.S. companies. Where do you see this kind of thing heading? Um, so I think on the government investment in private companies usually is not happening cross-border. You're not going to see too many NASA investments in Japanese companies directly. NASA will invest in domestic industry that domestic industry partners with international industry. So it's kind of the industry to industry, government to government cooperation. So you won't see too much of that, but you will see a lot of government investment in their domestic industry and that's happening. That's, that's gone. I mean, NASA is investing in the SpaceX to send uh, cargo and crew to the space station. JAXA and Japan are investing in companies like us to do these missions. It, it's the next step of any ecosystem. It's, it's how the airlines started. It's how, uh, it's, it's how so many uh, technical um, innovations began. Begins with government investment when it's too hard to make money. Once that gets spun up and the technical capability is there, then it switches to the private sector. That's, we're in the midst of that right now. We're at the cusp of that right now. So, so it's happening. We're going through that shift. Mikasko sensei, do you have? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Also, the I'm working together with, uh, you know, uh, I can say, our government uh, on the space technology, and we are thinking that, uh, you know, uh, what we want to do is, you know, gets more varied and larger and larger. But uh, you know, our budget is very much limited. 
So the actually one of the solution is the inclusion of the private, you know, uh, sectors funding. So that's very, very important and indispensable in order to make our, you know, space activity larger. So in Japan and also the space uh, policy committee is, you know, I guess uh, focusing on the inclusion of the private, you know, companies, you know, funding and also the, you know, capability. So that's very, very important now. And and one thing that I I, I found exciting is that, um, as Chris said, it's very difficult for NASA as a government agency to kind of directly fund Japanese companies and vice versa. JAX, JAXA doesn't necessarily fund U.S. companies. But one of the things that I've I've seen recently a lot is uh, companies working together. For example, NASA has a program called the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, or CLPS, where we are paying companies to take payloads to the lunar surface through the Artemis program. And so what we've seen is, you know, we have one company, MIT Draper Laboratories, who's the prime, but when they've self-selected three other companies as subcontractors, and one of them is, is a company called iSpace here in Japan. So, 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 so they are the main contractors of NASA, Draper Laboratories, and then they have General Dynamics, Space Flight Industries, and then iSpace, because iSpace is building the landers and rovers, and iSpace is a Japanese startup company that has an expertise that they need to make a kind of a good proposal for the for the for this clips program. So I'm saying I think one of the things that's really exciting is how um, maybe it's difficult for the direct funding Japanese companies, but companies are looking across the globe and kind of partnering with each other, you know, in terms of making sure that if they bid for a NASA contract or Jack Jack's a contract or some other some kind of contract that they have the strongest team. And sometimes that team uh, can include uh, you know, a company from Japan or, or another country. So I think that's really exciting. And I think in the future, you're going to see more of that, those kind of collaborations between companies. Are these collaborations just within the past 10 years or has it been going on for much longer? I, I think that the commercial sector has kind of, kind of spiked up in the last. Just recently? Yeah, recently. Interesting. So, yeah. And Sorry. the iSpace will launch their first, you know, moon lander next year. So this is, you know, they will do that before the Japanese government will do the landing. And so I think it's very, very interesting. Mm. Thank you. Um, Chris, you recently attended the 72nd International Astronautical Congress in Dubai. Uh, what was the atmosphere there like and how has it changed? With, uh, in, in terms of COVID or in terms of space? <laughs> Both if they intersect. <laughs> uh, it was really the first international conference in two years. So from the COVID side, uh, it was good to see, you know, people back. Everybody was back. This was before the latest uptick. Uh, so there was uh, there was a lot of excitement uh, to be at, at this at this conference, uh, and you could see the um, the uh, the pent up energy and excitement of the industry wanting to get back and, and talk and, and collaborate. Uh, in terms of the space side, uh, it was in Dubai. So right there is something telling about the space industry. The International Astronautical Congress was held in Dubai uh, and there was a lot of Middle Eastern companies and governments there that were talking about going to space. So again, to think about the evolution of the space sector from two countries who are launching huge, I mean, billion dollar programs, uh, racing each other to the moon in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, to where we are now, which is this democratized, decentralized version of space. It's really fascinating. And it's happening not in just a couple of these big countries, it's happening in countries around the world. Every country has a space agency or wants a space agency. When I was in Garvey's position, I was going to Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines and Thailand, and they all have space agencies. And they're all excited about inspiring their youth and educating them in aerospace. It's exciting, it's thrilling. Now, it's also a little worrying as I talked about because they're all shooting satellites into orbit. Um, but it, it's really exciting and it, it gives me, I mean, it, it, it can instill fear or hope. I, I'll, I'll take the latter, uh, I'll take the hope, but we certainly need to be prepared for what's, for what's coming, so. I've got one last question for the panel. 
On November 15th, as you mentioned, the Russian Federation conducted a destructive test of a direct ascent anti-satellite missile against one of its own satellites. Uh, the debris from this test appears to be a serious safety and security risk. We're curious about how something like this is handled for ships in international waters that are governed by the law of the sea. And is something like space law, does that exist? How is this kind of navigated? It's that one's to me too. Um, it was it was really shocking. It was really uh, hard to find the words to express how disappointing it is to see this. Now, to be clear, America has done this. Uh, India has done this. China has done this. Russia has done this. Um, America hasn't done it for a while. I don't remember when the last time, but it was a long time ago. And most of it was usually in, in lower Earth uh, orbit. So the debris deorbited quickly. It by itself naturally deorbited. Um, this was at uh, about 500 kilometers altitude is where this ballistic event took place. And the debris spread out into two different planes. Some went up a little higher, some went down a little lower. Um, you probably saw the news that uh, piece, uh, that the people, that the, the astronauts in the space station had to prepare to evacuate. You might have seen the news that just a couple days ago, yesterday, a spacewalk was canceled because of a potential debris incident. Yeah, it just was yesterday, I think it came out, that they, they canceled the spacewalk. Now, I don't know if this was because of the Russian debris. I don't know if they've identified that as the problem, but it certainly added to a problem that already exists. Um, we, Astroscale, put out a statement saying that we condemn this, as we would do uh, if anybody did something like this. We did the same when India made a, a, a test like this. Um, it's, a, it's a dangerous environment already. This destabilizes it more in terms of the debris that's up there but it also destabilizes it more in terms of the potential geopolitical issues that this is creating. Uh, so, yeah, it's it, it's uh, it's disappointing and and it's risky and it's it's worrying. But um, the the positive is the global community spoke out against it quickly. So we hope that we can uh, mitigate it and not see it happen again. So may, may I ask? So uh, the debris generated by this, you know, event is tracked by the ground ob observation and so on? Yeah, it's tracked. I, I don't know how many pieces came from this one. Do you know? Yeah. 1,500. 1,500 oh. pieces of debris from this event. And, and they, again, it's they... going down or... Well, both. They kind of, they split. They, they, you know, when, when the, the ballistic event happened, it split in two areas. And so um, the ones that go up... Uh, and uh, an object at about 500 or 550 kilometers altitude is going to stay in orbit. Uh, it will naturally decay, but it will stay in orbit for uh, 10 years or so, 10 to 15 years at that altitude. So there's 10 to 15 years of these additional, and let's say half of them went up and half of them went down. Let's say 800 pieces of new pieces of debris. That means new risks to the environment are now in orbit for another 10 to 15 years. Um, yes, from a NASA standpoint, obviously very concerning. Um, the NASA administrator um, spoke out about it. The Secretary of State um, also spoke out about it. Just the concerns that, you know, additional debris, irresponsible use of space. Um, as Chris mentioned, you know, we had to make sure that our astronauts on the International Space Station were protected. We had to look at kind of a program for NASA and, and make sure that, you know, we we, we looked out at, the, at kind of the kind of what was going on at the time and, and make sure that everybody was safe. So it was, it was very concerning. And, um, you know, as as we utilize space more, we have to make sure that, you know, everything we do um, is, is done responsibly. And so, um, yeah, across the board, it was, it was very concerning. Yeah, maybe the space role is, is very important, but very, but it's very difficult because, uh, you know, uh, space is very much related to the, you know, each country's interest of the, for example, uh, you know, security or, you know, defense and or industry and so on. Many, many, you know, such kind of the interest exist uh, from by the different countries. So it's very difficult to make it. So I want to have a, something like a superpower uh, to, you know, control such kind of the issue, but it's very difficult. So maybe, but we should do that. We should do something. Okay. Thank you. All right. That was my last question. So we're going to open it up for a Q&A from the audience and from those virtual. Uh, we've got one here in the corner. And anyone online, please feel free to use the Q&A function to submit your questions. I'll try to mix them in as we can.
And we could all please use the microphone too so that everyone hears both sides. Much appreciated. Sure, thanks very much. Actually, I have two questions if you don't mind. The first is, Chris, do you need security clearance of some sort to get those socks? When does Garvey have it, or you know, the sort of special Nassau type socks? Are they available for public consumption? They are. Okay. <laughs> curious to know. Curious to know. Uh, the second question is is actually it's kind of a follow on to this. It 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 uh, not the socks. The uh, the the. the you know, you talk about this being an international effort. You launch something from Kazakhstan. You have people sitting in Colorado. You have people sitting in Israel. And and the, the whole kind of globalization, if you will, of the space effort. Um, I'm, I'm really quite curious about your, your, your frank views on this. It, it doesn't sound like there's any nascent uh, law of the sea project that there's a UN body trying to create it or it, it doesn't. It sounds like it's completely ungoverned. And that no one's trying to create a international right of way, much less who chooses who. If if all these people want to launch satellites, they're not all doing it. They're not all going to create their own satellite launch site. Who controls access to Kazakhstan? How did you get that, by the way? And what if the Russians or the Chinese decide to not be cooperative, and in certain ways, and and shooting down a satellite is indications of an ability to not be cooperative, shall we say? Uh, Who's governing that? Is there is there a international body that's been formed uh, to have that superpower? I think that that was mentioned. So um, yeah, it's it's such a complicated issue, and that's actually what makes the job so interesting, <laughs> uh, challenging but interesting. To the first part, that there is a group within the UN called UN COPUS, UN Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. That does exist, but now how powerful is the UN really? <laughs> How much can they really uh, impart a law that is followed? They can't. So it's a combination of domestic laws and international best practices. And that's what we have to get to. So on the domestic laws side, every satellite that launches needs a license. You need to get a license from a country that's saying, yes, I agree that this satellite can launch. I'm vouching for the fact that it is as safe as we think it can be. So does that mean at this point, everybody has approval from a government when they launch? Yes. Even if it's Branson or it's it's yes. Bezos, some government has actually said, okay, you can do that. Yes. You can't just- You can't just off. shoot stuff up. Um, yeah, every, every, every satellite that launches uh, is getting a license to do so. Now, I guess, could you do it? I mean, if a, if a rogue country decided they just wanted to shoot, I guess you could. Um, they're not going to stop them. But but right now, the the community agrees that every every country that launches something, including China, including Russia, they're getting a license from those countries to launch. We got our launch license from the United Kingdom, from the UK. We have an office in the UK. We are operating the satellite that's in orbit, ELSA. We are operating this from the UK. And so we got our launch license, our, our license from the UK. Uh, and then you have to get other licenses. We have to get a, what's called a spectrum license, which is uh, to, to be able to communicate with it. We got that from Japan. Uh, but then we also launched it on a Russian rocket from Kazakhstan, Russia, sort of. I mean, it's a Russian base in Kazakhstan. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot we could talk about this. Uh, the bottom line is you're right in that it is really complicated. There is no overarching law of the space right now. People are talking about it. We're working on it. I'm on various committees. Our other people are in our company are on various committees with an effort to try to coalesce around something that can be similar to the law of the sea. But to, to use one final example here, with the law of the sea, uh, with law of salvage law, in the ocean, if a if a if a boat is left in the ocean and and it's abandoned, it's it's open. You know, you can you well you're free to go board it and use it. That doesn't exist in space. There is no salvage law in in orbit. When something's launched, it is the responsibility of that company and country in perpetuity until it comes down and burns up. It's it's the responsibility of that that country. So, it's a, a bit of the wild west. Uh, which again makes it really tough, but we're we're moving toward something that that looks a little bit more um, formalized and official. 
And and also, uh, can I ask a little bit about that? You know, we at NASA, we also saw that there was kind of kind of be a, a potential problem area in terms of there's an outer space treaty, but it's pretty old and it's not, it doesn't really go far enough. And as many countries, you know, go back, you know, go to the moon, NASA's going back to the moon, but many countries, as you know, China has, has launched, you know, their uh, Chang'e, series of Chang'e missions, and they landed on the far side of the moon. And there's a really a lot of countries that are trying to, you know, go back to the moon now. Um, and so what we did at NASA is we started something called the Artemis Accords. And the Artemis Accords is kind of what we thought was kind of a rules of the road, kind of a set of principles, guidelines. Um, you know, there's not there's not really enforcement, but we thought if enough countries joined the Artemis Accords, that it would kind of set a set of norms that, you know, irresponsible behavior when we go back to the moon uh, wasn't, wasn't good. And so we started off with Japan was one of the signatories to the Artemis Accords, and we started off with about seven countries, and now we have 14. We want to continue to grow, and I, I just pulled it up, make sure I didn't miss anything, the kind of what the Hardman course it includes, it includes that, you know, when you go to the moon, uh, you want to use it for peaceful purposes. Uh, you want to be transparent. Um, you want to have interoperability, means, you know, you want to be able to help each other out, right? You want to make them interoperable. You want emergency assistance if somebody's on the moon and they get some problems. You want to, be, you want to help them out. You want to don't leave them there, right? Um, registration of space object, make sure that you, what you take up there, that you register, that everybody knows you're taking up there. Um, release of scientific data, kind of like NASA's biggest, one of the NASA's things is, is, you know, we want to make data free and open. You know, you want to make sure that everybody has the data that goes up there that, you know, it's free and open. Um, a protecting heritage, if there are sites that are up there that are heritage sites on the moon, we want to make it a protecting heritage sites. Uh, space resources, which you go up there is kind of like that. De Deconfliction of activities um and orbital debris and spacecraft disposal kind of what you said to make sure that what you take up there that you dispose of properly so those are kind of the 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 things that are in the artemis accords that we've already had uh, 14 countries sign up to and we expect that more and more countries are going to be um, um signing up there. and some of those countries have kind of plans to go to the moon and some of them don't but they just believe that these set of principles who are kind of responsible behaviors, kind of set a set of norms when we all do get up there in the moon that we that, that there's some kind of norm. So we realize that, that there's a hole there. And so the Artemis Accords, different than the Artemis program, the Artemis Accords is something we started to try to kind of set a set of norms as we go all go back to the moon. Thank you. We got an interesting question that came in online. Maybe this one's for you, Garvey. In recent years, we've seen the official acknowledgement by the U.S. and other governments of numerous encounters with craft that outperform jets by orders of magnitude and use propulsion systems that are essentially different and vastly superior to any publicly acknowledged technology we possess. This would seem to indicate either a staggering technological leap by a nation here on Earth or the presence of something from beyond it. In either case, a huge noise story. As we prepare to venture beyond the shallows of space, what do you make of these news stories and to what do you attribute the surprisingly muted response they have received in the public so far? <laughs> so we're talking. Are there aliens? Are there aliens? That's the question. What do you make of the response? A lot of people are talking lately about all of these sightings or these videos coming out of things that, that people from the Air Force have seen. And uh, what do you make of it? What do you make of the public's response so far? What do you think? You're a an alien or I am an alien? <laughs> 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 Go ahead. We always have this game. Do you want to go ahead and start? I, I don't. I. I oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I. Um. I can't. Yes. Speechless. I and I can't speak for NASA, but um, I. I haven't. You know. I. I know. There's all of these things that are out there. Like, what's the what's the big one? Owam Owama Uma. Did you guys hear this one? The big. Uh, do you remember how? Who who knows how to pronounce it? Owama Uma. It was found from a Hawaiian telescope. Huge. Um. Ob, ob, oblong. Kind of rock that was totally uh, disobeying laws of physics as we could understand it. It seemed to be. Uh, how does that happen? Uh, I, I don't. I don't know enough about it to speak to those kind of instances uh, with any type of educational background on that. But I mean, yeah, there's there's probably other intelligent life out there. I mean, if that's the question. <laughs> the, the, the muted response, I'm not sure, uh, but when you when you think about how big, how many billions of planets there are, how many trillions of stars, and you have telescopes that NASA is developing, Kepler, that is finding Earth-like planets 
just in like, just, just next door, you know, galactically, galactically next door. Hundreds of Earth-like planets, planets that are close to a star, similar to the sun, not too hot, not too cold, the Goldilocks planets. They look like they could have life. And we're finding so many just right next door. So might, should there be something? I mean, mathematically, it would be hard to believe there's not. But I don't know. I never saw anything at NASA that I can't tell you about. So, <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not a, I've, I've been at NASA 18 years yet. And I've, you know, we've never found any signs of life outside of Earth so far, right? We never found, you know, of all the satellites we're saying, we haven't found it yet. So one of NASA's goals is to look for life. And, you know, a lot of people think that it's kind of kind of people with one eye and, and you know, like that. but I'm thinking any, any sign of life, I think outside of our solar system, whether it's, you know, microbes or any, any living things, I think from a scientific standpoint would be, you know, really exciting. So, you know, the sightings and everything, I can't speak for that, but I know that, um, you know, that, you know, NASA continues to send satellites and one of, you know, satellites to different planets. And one of the things that we're looking for is any kind of signs of life, because any kind of signs of life on a place like Mars would be really beneficial in terms of scientific standpoint, of how potentially we can keep humans alive on, on other bodies. So I think, you know, we're looking for that. But I think the, the main point, I think, um, and from my standpoint is, you know, NASA sends satellites to all throughout our solar system, you know, we have, you know, James Webb Space Telescope is going to look beyond our solar system, but we haven't found any planet yet that is perfect for life is at Earth. So one of NASA's biggest things is, you know, Earth science, you know, looking at and providing data um, to decision makers so they can make informed decisions about how to protect our precious Earth. I mean, I think that the point is, I think that, you know, you know, you can explore you know, you can see these other planets, you can, tra Trappist-1 was another one we found that's kind of potentially had, could have like a star like the sun and, you know, four or five planets going, I think it was six planets going around it. But the most important thing is, um, you know, in our solar system, um, there's nothing like Earth. You look outside, it's a beautiful Earth. So I think, to me, the most important thing is we have to do all we can to, 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 uh, to protect our Earth. But our solar system is like one, one on this picture, a huge, huge beach. Our solar system is this one speck of sand. And so we're looking like at the next speck of sand. And we're saying, no, we haven't found anything there. But I mean, even, even just the, the little bit, even if you take a circle and run a stick around that sand, like a little like one, one, one foot diameter stick, that's about what we're seeing now. There's so much we haven't seen. That's an exciting time. We got time for another question. Um, so I have heard that SpaceX has made this new rocket called Starship landing on Mars. And what type of technology has um, been created to land humans on Mars? So, so good question. I think that, um, you know, you know, I think, uh, you know, the Artemis program going to Mars is a part of the Artemis program. And so, you know, one thing we want to do is go to the moon first and build an infrastructure there and go to Mars. And there's a number of challenges um, from a NASA standpoint to uh, making sure that a humans protected, you know, on Mars. And so I think it's a it's a it's a progression or incremental step. Um, and we're not there yet. Uh, one of the things, you know, is it Star Trek or, or Star Wars that says go where no man has gone no before? Star Trek. That sounds cool, but we don't do that. Uh, we, we go to as, that place as many times as we can because the most important thing is if we do go to a place with humans, we got to keep them alive, right? And Mars is a very harsh environment. There's a lot of radiation there. Right now, with the propulsion we have, it takes about six months. And so I'm not really kind of an expert on the, on the, on the, um, on the, on the, on the SpaceX plans to go to, to Mars, but I know from a NASA standpoint, um, you know, that's the, that's the goal in terms of the next destination after the moon, but we're not ready yet. Um, as you know, when, when humans go out and uh, there's no gravity, they have a lot of bone loss and some of the ways to mitigate that we're still working on. We've learned a lot about on that about the International Space Station. So it's an incremental step. But I think, um, at least from our standpoint, um, one of the parts of the Artemis program is eventually send humans to Mars. And so we're trying to do as much, learn as much as we can in terms of what we do on the International Space Station lower Earth orbit. We're going to do a lot of more research when we get back to the moon. And then um, eventually we want to send humans to Mars. We named the, the orbital structure that we're going around the moon, we call it the gateway. And we named that on purpose because that is going to gateway 
um, to get to Mars eventually. So it's a gateway to be able to do a lot of stuff on the lunar surface in terms of teleoperations and stuff we're going to do on the moon, but eventually it's going to be a gateway to go on to Mars. And so it's it's a priority of ours, And uh, but we're not there yet, but um, I think that um, we eventually want to get there. Thank you. There's a question in the back. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions and I promise I'm not going to ask about your socks. OK, so um, the first one is what is the major technical challenge for speeding up your product program? And the second one is what is your time frame expectation to start becoming really commercially viable to start getting the stuff out of the <laughs> of the orbit? So. I'll answer the thank you. I'll answer the second one. That's one I can answer. I answer both of them, but I've got an expert in the audience who can answer the first one. So I'm going to I'm going to wait for a second and if you're okay, Gene, I'm going to turn it to you. But on the second one, the commercially viable, um, we have multiple missions doing R&D testing over the next 3 to 5 years. We think we're going to start uh, becoming commercially viable by mid to late 20s by the 2030 we see that this is going, this idea of satellite servicing, it's going to be commonplace. You see the celebration we had when we did that first test, it's going to be, it's going to be boring. It's going to be what we do. So we think that certainly by the end of the decade, we're going to be uh, commercially viable, offering uh, consistent servicing for satellites in orbit. Gene? Hello. Yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm Gene, um, the chief engineer for Astroskill. So in regards to technology, I'll tell you what's interesting is to, we're not really inventing anything new, but what the challenge is for us and to do the missions that Chris described that is unique is, you know, we've built and put satellites in the space for many years, um, but what the hard part is to how do you get one satellite to approach another. Now, that is being done in different situations, especially with the space station. So we rendezvous with uh, astronauts and cargo to the space station. But in our case, what's never been really done before is taking two objects and making them come together. It's kind of like um, if you were driving down the highway at 100 miles an hour and you need to jump into a car that's also going 100 miles per hour, and, and that's sort of the analogous of the challenge. But the comment that I want to uh, give to you is that the technology wise, we're really not inventing anything new. So these sensors that we're using, we're using like a regular old cam, not old, but like a regular camera that takes pictures. We're using a sensor called a LIDAR, which if you're not familiar with, it's used a lot in the autonomous cars on the ground. Um, and so it's a sensor that's used in, in applications here on Earth. Uh, we're using range finders, which are also used here on Earth. Um, but the secret sauce is putting it together and making it work as a system. And that, that is a challenge. Um, but technology-wise, it's interesting that we're really not inventing anything new to do this. It's really just putting the ideas together, putting the pieces together to make it work as a system uh, on a very complex mission, which is driving down the highway at 100 miles an hour and trying to jump over to another car. And so I would add one thing to Gene's comment that ties to your other one. We're trying to do it cheaply, affordably. Everything that Garvey talked about, was a NASA mission. I think you guys know what government missions can cost. <laughs> it's not going to propel the economy forward. We're trying to do this so that it becomes economically attractive. And that's that's the other big challenge, I think. Thank you. I've got another question from a virtual attendee. Uh, when I was young, space camp was really popular. Um, does anything like this exist in Japan? Is this the best way still for young people to enter the space industry? Yes, uh, in Japan and the uh, this kind of the space technology area is very popular and many people want to come into this area. And the, I think uh, uh, 
the activities which we are doing, just kind of the cancer to, you know, uh, satellite development is very, very attractive to the many people. And the, the important thing is that once they come into this area, they, uh, they took every effort. They are taking every effort to realize their missions. So that kind of the activity is very, very important. And because this is a kind of the problem solving training. So it's very, very important. And the, this problem solving training can contribute not only to the space, but also to the many other technological areas. So the many people in Japan is now trained in the field of the space technology and to go to the different area because uh, uh, still the you know, Japanese space industry is not so big. And, uh, but the, you know, uh, space technology is now providing such kind of a very good material of the training to the many, many people. And still, many people are interested in the space in Japan. Okay. Mm. Thank you. We've got a question here. Um, what is the point of trying to colonize the moon if the moon is um, partially made out of Earth materials due to the collision with Thea? Um, is it like for research or any other purposes? So you were looking at me when you asked that, but that question is way too hard for me to answer. Well, kind of I can't really look at <laughs> so I'll, I'll pass it. I, I actually do have an opinion on this, but I'm going to pass your gaze down the way to our NASA guy who's talking about going to the moon. So, yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, I think uh, we show we show that uh, I think, you know, one of the NASA's uh, goals is to extend uh, human presence um, in a solar system. And so uh, the moon is relatively close and we know we've sent humans there. And so we think that's a good place um, for humans to kind of to live outside of our own solar system. So I think that's one. I think since we stopped the Apollo program in 1972, we've sent a lot of robotic missions uh, to the moon. And we know that now that the moon has a lot of water on the poles of the moon, both North and the South Pole. And so we, we, we haven't really figured out how we're gonna get that water. But we know that you know one of the things on Earth that you need to have a sustainable approach is water, and so if you can you know somehow extract that water, you don't have to take it as 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 Nakaska Sensei said, you don't have to take it with you. You you can just use the water that's already there if we can get it. Um, and if there's water in any place, you can use it for a lot of things. Um, you could probably use it to grow food or drink or split it in hydrogen oxygen and make fuel and, and stuff like that. And so. We feel like you know the water right now on the moon is a really good place, really good um, resource for a sustainable approach. So I just think just the overall, the goal of, of exploration, finding you know moving beyond our solar system, finding out things to be, what's on what's beyond Earth. Uh, the moon is relatively close, and more important, it has resources like water that we can use to have a sustainable approach. I just think it's for NASA's perspective, it's it's the next step. So very good question. Um, but would it be economically plausible? Economic plausible to rise the moon. How much would it cost? Uh, <laughs> Love yeah. it. I've got answers to this, but go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's your yeah. question. It's your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't. I don't know how much it costs. That's a good question. I, 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 uh, I, can I? Can I phone a friend? <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll I'll ask my friends and I'll get back. I'll I'll get your contact information. But I, I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't think we don't we know how much it's going to cost. Um, you know, that's one of the things in exploration is that you don't you don't know what's out there until you get there. So I think you know we're gonna we have a budget for um, Artemis. <laughs> we'll probably you know it probably costs a little bit more than that. But um, um, yeah, it's it's is our next step. I'd like to hear your answer too, Chris. Go ahead. I I have some comments, but Nakaska sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe so. Uh, in order to reduce the cost to colonize the moon, maybe you, we should have uh, some technology to create something using the you know something like a uh, how can I say uh, existing material on the moon. So for example, we have uh, many sand on the moon, and if we have a technology to make this sand into uh, some building or something then we don't have to bring the very heavy things from the earth. So such kind of the create something using the material over there is very important. And the water is too. We should find out some water. And the water can be H2 and O2, and that will be used for the fuel. 
So the water is very, very important. So we should find out where the water exists and how we can extract the water from the rock or sand. That is very, very important technology. So in, in this way, we should create something using the material over there. That is a very important technology into the future. And we know that the water on, on the lunar surface is, is frozen water. So you're very smart. So you got to help us figure out how we can, you know, extract that water. It's, it's, it's there, but it's not, it's not going to be that easy to get. I, I think you're going to have to see a commercial reason to go. Uh, and by commercial, I mean companies who see a money-making perspective to do it. If it's just government, I don't think it's, I, it's going to be very hard because it's going to be very expensive and governments change and priorities change and it's going to be tough. You might get some people up there with Apollo. We started and then NASA had plans to launch more missions, but they didn't have the money and they didn't have the incentive. If you can get something that has a commercial benefit, whether that's tourism or mining or setting up a, a, a yeah, just like a hotel, like tourism, yeah, then you're going to start seeing that happen. And, and people want to go to the moon and onto Mars because there's this idea of a multi-planetary species. We can't, we can't survive just on Earth. Your kids, 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 grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren might need a place to go. And so we have to start somewhere. And so this is the closest place to start, like Harvey said. Thank you for answering my question. <laughs> Yeah, but great question. And, and I, yeah, I think you're right. We, we need to really involve the commercial sector as much as possible. That's going to give us a sustainable approach. But there's got to be not just commercial sector involved, but a commercial incentive to do it. Right. So that, that there's got to be a reason why companies and people want to pay to go there. And if we can't find that, it's going to be tough. It really is, I think. Sorry. We've got time for one last question. Mr. Kruger. That, that kind of uh, leads me to my question. The, the cooperation between government and industry, it doesn't always look so efficient, right? So you've got this SpaceX and uh, Blue Origin for the moon lander, and they sort of had a falling out with the US government, and now there seems to be a lawsuit. Can you comment a little bit on the efficiency? Like, do you, do you foresee this being the only way? And Because like, like also Apollo, right? It was the smartest people in one room, right? They were all in, in the government, and they got us there in eight years. Do we think we're going to get there in a cooperation between government and industry? Um, uh, so, yes, I think we're going to. Uh, the 60s, there's a, there's a lot of reasons why we were able to do what we did as quickly as we did. It was, that was the only game in town. NASA's budget was 5% of the federal budget at the time. Now it's less than 1%. I mean, at the time, NASA's mission was get to the moon as fast as you can. Now NASA's mission is a bunch of stuff. James Webb Space Telescope, which cost $8 billion. I mean, it's, it, it's a lot of other distributed ideas. So it's tough to focus uh, the way that we did in the 60s. So I think it's, it's tough to compare that era with today. But what, what gives me hope on this is that there are so many companies out there. And we're going to... I'd almost see like the Blue Origin, SpaceX, maybe turn that as a positive thing. The same way that there are legal disputes with contractors for any kind of terrestrial based industry, those happen all the time. Now it's happening on the moon. And so, yeah, there's gonna be inefficiencies. Government has inefficiencies, but we're, we're moving toward a, a more mm, uh, kind of natural ecosystem in space. Uh, the good and bad of that. And so I, I, I see that as, as being, I'd, I'd like to see that as being progress. Toward that. And, you know, the, you know, I, I kind of watched from afar, uh, we're, we're working at NASA, trying to watch the, uh, um, the relationship between like a SpaceX and NASA. You know, you know, when we had the shuttle, it was pretty much a U.S. government vehicle. And, you know, you know, NASA, it, you know, was kind of an expensive vehicle, but it was, it was highly efficient. And then, you know, we had the commercial players first come on with cargo and crew, and they kind of sold Congress and NASA on the fact that they could do a lot cheaper. And the NASA said, if you're going to take cargo and crew to our space station, we want to make sure that you're doing safe and had all these requirements. And so, you know, SpaceX and these companies said, Northrop Grumman said, 
now it's become more expensive because you have requirements and we can't we want to do it cheaper. So it was a learning process. It wasn't, you know, made overnight. It's going to continue to be a learning process, you know, as we go forward, you know, working together because, you know, the government, like you said, you know, the, there's a there's an understanding that the commercial sector can do it cheaper and the government, you know, maybe we do a little more expensive, but we have a different role. We have to make sure that we're, you know, doing things safely. You know, and we do kind of like Chris said, larger projects and projects that may be a little bit more riskier. And so we have to make sure that, you know, our government astronauts and people that we send to space are, are, you know, totally safe. And so, you know, there's kind of give and take there and, and it wasn't easy, but it was a very interesting process. So I think, you know, it won't be easy, but I think as, as we said today, that there's a, there's a, there's a role for the government and that's maybe to, to do things a little bit more riskier, the more, a little bit more expensive and maybe be the leaders. And there's a role of the private sector, and that's kind of help us get that sustainable approach and be innovative and find ways to make a profit, make money. And so when we do work together, there's going to be a learning process and it won't be easy. But I think um, so far, you know, if you look at what we've done on the International Space Station, we found a way to get there. And so I think it's going to be a learning process. Thank you. Great note to end on. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for spending your evening with us. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight as well. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.